Everybody mute. Welcome to Verse Virtual's August reading. It's hard to believe it's already August and we're hurtling toward November. Uh, I'm sure that's on many of our minds. Uh, I'm happy to have you for today's Verse Virtual reading featuring Lori Kuntz and Dorcia, what's your last name, Dorcia? Um, Smith Silva. Ah, thank you. Thank you so much. I should always have the bios out when I introduce. But in any case, it's, I'm happy to have them um, here today and happy to have you, whether you are uh, actually in the room or coming to us later on uh, by watching the recording. A uh, reminder that the recordings are posted on the Verse Virtual 2024 page. Um, past recordings and present recordings, uh, you can always find them there and uh, learn more about Verse Virtual, read the journal. Uh, and we welcome you to do that and to send things into the journal as well. Uh, so today we're going to start with uh, Lori, Lori Coons, and let me get the bio. Lori Coons's books are That Infinite Roar, published by Gyroscope Press, Talking Me Off the Roof, by Kelsey Books, The Moon Over My Mother's House by Finishing Line Press, Simple Gestures, Texas Review Press, Women at the Onsen, Blue Light Press, and Somewhere in the Telling, oh boy, there's more, uh, Melon Press, Simple Gestures, One Texas Reviews, Chapbook Contest, and Women at the Onsen, One Blue Light Press's Chapbook Contest. She's been nominated for four Pushcart Prizes and two Best in the Net Prize. And in 2024, in case you think that it, no one ever wins one, she won it. So congratulations to her. And it gives us all hope. Her work has been published in Gyroscope Review, Roanoke Review, Third Wednesday, One Art, Sheila Naki, Anti-Heroin Sheet, and other journals. Happily retired. She lives in an endless summer state of mind. Thank you. Thank you for such a nice introduction. Thank you everybody for uh, coming today. And um, uh, yeah, thank you for giving up your Saturday. You know, it's sometimes hard to get to these Zoom things. Uh, I feel very thankful to read in a period of renewed light and hope as we approach November. And um, so I'm gonna start off with some uh, light poems and um, poems that deal with summer and, and all good things. And uh, it's August and it's watermelon season. So I'm gonna start with this poem uh, called, let me get it. Old married couple cutting watermelon. There are some things we just don't do well together. I am not your tennis partner. There are some mountains you climb alone. I cannot sing while you tune your guitar, but we have learned the rhythm of a couple with a cleaver. We both know how to check for ripeness, a long, a lawn green skin with a yellow sun bursting at its center, an ear to the rind checking for the sea caught in a shell sound. At home, we prepare the counter, find a balance so the orb does not roll, fill containers with ruby red squares that will quench our aging thirst. One July day, while you napped, the temperature grew thick as watermelon skin. Alone in the kitchen, I tackled the green ball with a serrated edge, found the sweet spot on the counter to conquer the roll, sliced the fruit in halves and quarters until plates were glowing with squares looking like polished 
gems. What I thought was a job for two, I could do by myself. Handle a knife, square a slice, dispose of rinds, fill a bowl that only I would gorge from, a selfish appetite quenched. Alone in the kitchen, I picked the ripest pieces, but the juices did not burst nor run over my tongue with the same coupled sweetness. And from watermelon, we're gonna go to uh, French fries and milkshakes. And this one's called the Paris Diner. Sometimes my appetite scrolls back to the days where I never worried about greasy pleasures, dripping in sugared condiments. And I wanna be back at the Paris Diner with you at 2 a.m high from every urge. The Paris diner was not in Paris. Paris was not in our vocabulary. It was only a dive in Flatbush that we stumbled into on nights when everything was satiated by a yearning for fries and ketchup and whipped cream dripping over those curved fountain glasses. Between our heated flesh and furtive kisses, we sipped something thick and creamy, and our simple lives flowed through a paper straw. Okay. Um, and if Maggie is here, I think she is, um, shout out to my friend Maggie, who came to the Paris Diner with me all the time when we were 17. So hope Maggie's here. Um, and this is a new poem. It's always a little bit nerve wracking to read new poems, but um, what gives me confidence with this new poem is it was just published in Anti-Heroin Chic, which, is, which was one of my bucket list magazines. So I, was, so I feel confident to read it. It's called Balance. I could write endlessly about all things foreboding, hurricanes and turbulence, more likely due to warmer air that carries us to a season we hope to thrive in. From June's blossoms come a life in harvest. Dark soil blankets the roots of all that green. A pasture, cross-haired vines, meadows abundant with wild petals upon petals. Every bloom opens to summer's endless embrace and we live as if nothing will ever end. But an end always comes. Hurricanes and turbulence take over a country's spirit, a body's betrayal, an erosion of simple kindness. Yet somewhere, a child is learning to ride a wave. A mother is picking lilacs and lavender. A father holds the seat of a two-wheel bike promising not to let go. We need that balance to embrace an endless summer state of mind while dancing in the eye of the storm. And um, this poem is called Options. It's also a pretty new poem. And um, Options. In the beginning, we had time to tally who spited, who hurt, who forgave first. We could nurse our anger for weeks, turning it into a game until one of us cried, uncle. We bullied time thinking it would never fight back, but now time wins and winds around us with an aging wisdom. It hardly matters who dirtied the new white towels, forgot to turn off the lights, locked the back gate, ate the last poppy seed muffin, broke the porcelain coffee mug, or refused to kill the spider. One of us will always be left hungry, in the dark, afraid of things that crawl into open entryways. In our waning days together, we can no longer waste the time that stretches between us. 
Our history is branded by the flames we create. We can choose to stay in the pan or jump into the fire. Um, okay. Uh, now I'm going to read some old love poems. They're not, it's not poems that are old, but it's poems for old people who have been in love for a long time, old, old relationships. Um, so uh, this one is uh, called A Finding Polaris. Finding Polaris. You can always pinpoint it, looking for the triangular shine. I want to learn to find that light on the nights I'll be alone. For so much depends upon what we leave each other. Somewhere in the story is our true north. Directions to travel alone. To remember to lift our faces, gaze upward. We need now to create new ways to look at old stars. Even though I would rather dwell in our past heavens when desire was in a turn of phrase and the indigo sky was clearly plentiful, on those nights you take my hand, trace beginnings and endings of the constellations that lit our lives. And... Um, um, okay, thank you. Um, you know, when I try to write political poems in this political landscape of today, um, I, I need to turn to the children. I think that's the only way to get all that's on our chests off. So um, I'll, this poem is called Recital, and it's for the children. Recital. They are practicing in studios, poster wall bedrooms, on sunlit terraces, children learn to paste a smile on their scrubbed and fresh faces for an audience of grown-ups who marvel at the life and spirited bodies. On the gilded stage of their lives, children all over the world should be practicing their epaule, but some are taking other positions in cellars and dank crawl spaces. They should be gliding across polished floors, but today they pirouette into evacuation routes, keeping beat with the not so distant thunder. And this next poem also trying to deal with all the political stuff. Um, it used to be called, the title used to be called Scenes from Kiev. Then I changed it to scene, it used to be called Scenes from a Playground in Kiev. Then I changed it to Scenes from a Playground in Kibbutz Be'eri. Then I changed it to Scenes from a Playground in Gaza. And now I've changed it to Scenes from a Playground in every war-torn country. Bat and ball on a bench, father and son on a swing pumping past stairs and judgment, the dangers they face day by day. Now the father's muscled hands hold the swing's chains, promises not to let go. His son's joy is a shriek in the wind on this jacketless October morning. The swing reaches an unsteady height and the boy believes he can touch the sky's frontier where everyone is safe and boundless encased in a spring wary breeze. The father tells his son to hold tight as if what we hold on to will protect a father's promise, but a vow is not enough as a veil of fear surrounds us all today. When I turn my head, and look again, they are gone. But the swing taken by a ruthless wind still sways. Um, okay, thank you for listening. Um, you know, I worked in refugee education and resettlement for many, many years. And many of my beginning poems were about refugees, um, Southeast Asian refugees. And I find it unfortunate 
in a way that these poems still can resonate today with, again, the political landscape that we're in. So I'm going to read one of these very older, one, one of my older poems called Cambodian Vision. And it's after writer Alec Wilkinson's account of Mrs. M. Chien, who went blind while living under the Khmer Rouge rule. There was something called hysterical blindness, which affected many Khmer, especially Khmer women, um, who after the trauma, when they finally survived, the trauma caused them to go blind. It was called, um, it is called hysterical blindness. So this is a poem sort of about that. Cambodian vision. Water buffalo hitched to wagons, gilded temples in the backdrop of well-tended rice fields are all leaden shadows. What is left in the grim warrens of memory is the emblem of a soldier's smirk. A brother dragged into a shaded grove. Nothing exists except the sound of bamboo on bone. Family gold bought the rice she cooked for her brother's children. The scream of hunger and loss kept from their shriveled lips. In singed fields under the wake of soldiers, her sight dimmed. She could no longer see the faces of those she cared for. Every beginning disfigured. The future can only repeat what is gone. The tap of bougainvillea against paned windows wakes her now in California. Dust warms on wooden sills, lovers, enemies, the braiding of past and present, and once more, the sound of bamboo cracking. Um, I'll lighten it up a little bit. <laughs> um, I just came back um, from a Is high school. I'm sorry, Lori. I think you're out of time. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, sorry, I did time myself, but I guess that went off. Well, anyway, thank you. Thank you all for um, coming. And um, I'm looking forward to Dorcia's reading and everybody else's reading. And I truly appreciate everybody here. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I only had two more, so that's okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, let's see. Our our next feature is Dorcia Smith Silva coming to us from Puerto Rico. She's the author of An Inheritance of Drowning from Kevin Carey. Um, she's poetry editor of The Hopper and professor of English at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras. Piedras. Sorry. She's also the editor of Latina Chicana Mothering and the co-editor of seven books. She's received support from Bread Load and Martha's Vineyard Institute of Creative Writing. And she's a member of the Get the Word Out Poetry Cohort of Poet and Writers. She's thrilled that Inheritance of Drowning is on the book list of poetry books to read for fall by Publishers Weekly. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. So nice to be here. Thank you again for the invitation. Um, it's just amazing, Robbie. Thank you. And that was a wonderful reading, Lori. It's it's hard to follow that. So I I hope to keep the audience entertained. Um, as the introduction mentioned, I have my debut poetry book coming out. It is called An Inheritance of Drowning. That's the cover. And it is with Kevin Carey. So the book examines the experience of Hurricane Maria, which was a horrific event that happened in Puerto Rico and the Caribbean um, in 2017. So I have some hurricane poems that are in the book, and I also have some political poems in the book I'll be reading today, and then I'll lighten up the mood um, with some fun poems to end the reading for today. So the first poem I'm going to read is called My Grandmother's Photo. Sometimes we don't think about the mementos that can get lost. We're so worried about when hurricane season comes, do we have the basics? And then later we think about the personal mementos that can get, get damaged. So this is called My Grandmother's Photo. She smiles in black and white, cotton pleated dress with a thick belt. 
showing her newlywed 25 inch waist, a size four long before the folds of stretched skin from three children. Her ebony hair hangs in shiny cascading ringlets held by a slip of red ribbon and crystal combs. Her hand is wrapped tightly around my grandfather's, new gold branding their fingers, paid for by the weight of dirt and hot dawn mornings. With just one day, the rain washes out my grandmother's body and makes her a false whisper upon inspection. Brown dots replace her smile and her hands are swallowed by dark spirals and bubbles. The thin edges fall into wrinkled tatters, sprinkles of paper breaking faster from sheets of water. The wind pushes her cracked and rearranged beside an overturned car, like a new broken flower in the grave. So the next poem I'll read is called The Bee. And this is something else that we don't think about too sometimes with the environment. We don't think about how it's affecting animals or insects. So what I noticed after Hurricane Maria was that the, the bees were affected and they were looking for flowers for pollination. So this is my recollection upon seeing a bee looking for flowers. It's called The Bee. After Hurricane Maria, you spin in a daze punch drunk from the fetid fumes of the generator, but you have made a decision to eat, live. You leap onto a dark tan bra that is wildly flapping on the clothesline, eager to gather something sweet and bring it to the surface. And yet there is nothing there but a bare circle of cotton. You wonder how the hurricane galloped away with the flowers, triggering a vanishing act. Well, where is the magician's wand to bring back the canopy of blossoms? It must be in the wind of loss, along with the why and because. There is no way to tell you about the aftermath slow cruelty. It is a tale that claws cell by cell leaving wings to litter this earth. And now that I've read those poems, I'm going to shift into the political poems in the book. And this one is called How I Lost My Name. If you have an unusual or different or unique first name like I do, Dorcia, sometimes uh, educators, sometimes are hesitant to uh, say your name correctly or mispronounce it. So this is my experience uh, with that. How I lost my name. Your name, Dorcia, booms heavy like wide-eyed darkness, said my teacher, as if light sat on his tongue. So I became a ticker tape of nothing to be called and vanished into famine sounds. My classmates backbone this death sentence and left no disguise of this invisible girl at an elbow distance who waited her turn like being asked to slow dance against a backdrop of double-edged drowning. And then the next poem, which I mentioned is a political poem, this is about... Um, those girls that go missing that don't actually get national coverage. So it's called Ghost Talker Poem. Ghost Talker Poem. And for the black girls that go missing from newspaper headlines and spotlight 5 p.m. news, what happened to them? Kick the can over, see if the bones glint in the slips of sunshine. Press your ears against the grass. Listen to what bleeds. My mother in her lovely tongue. Those girls are probably with friends, hanging out in the basement, wearing cigarette pants. Cigarette pants were fashionable once. They will turn up like loose change sideline under sofa cushions. Overdue books sandwiched in sweaters. Favorite hairpins gagged by vent. 
don't fret. Fret is a funny word for a young child. Sounds like forget. Don't forget. I won't. About the missing black girls, probably already dead in a ditch or a field somewhere. I'm not supposed to think about death, passing away, kick the bucket six feet under, meeting our maker, which is what my teacher said. The class guinea pig had stopped moving. Mrs. Hayes poked its feet and then shoved it into a shoebox, said that we could bury it across from the tire swing in the back of the schoolyard. The dirt was ordinary, brown, hard. Eat your snacks, said my mother, Twinkies from 7-Eleven, maybe Wawa. Nothing from Super Fresh or Pathmark, white filling, creamy like white fungus, oozing like zit pus, besmirching golden cake. The news says nothing about black girls that go missing, not even a speck in someone's unread newspaper. Silence is when we inherit ghosts. I see them taking victory laps every night. And now for something lighter, um, something that we can think of in a positive way. For me, I always feel that way when I see the color green. Reminds me of, you know, nature, life. I feel so inspired. So this is a poem called, I Pause to Give Gratitude to Green. I pause to give gratitude to green. Green that breathes across sky's steel birdcage. Green after what hurricane season can muster. It gives me a sign of hope, like garden scented staircase collecting sunlight whenever I come closer to the teeth of desperation. Every evening sitting in the tunnels of gray violence, cars rotating to spiral highways. Green message, remember me here, here, here. Green glows like a future life's invitation. I call out like my mother in the doorway. Won't you stay for supper? Take a place right here next to me. The next one is also about green. And I think this will be my last poem because of time. So if so, then I end with a positive note. This one is called G is for Green Hood. And if you're interested, it's published on Terrain's uh, website, which is a journal that looks at different issues, but especially the environment. G is for green hood. For spring sitting on my shoulders, then fastening to eye level, Shantu's gladiola spinning, bowing in the distance, sense of green greening until earth gets it right, green that I can't keep to myself. Say, green belongs within reach, like an extract of sea pool outside of the flower body. You wouldn't recognize me when I cradle green for fear of it becoming worn in many places. Even when morning lurks upside down, green, not this green, never hurts. As the Turacos giving off green among drizzled leaves, as the grasshoppers that throw themselves against grass because it glistens, as wet green in my blood that hasn't forgotten spared green across homeland where your green overlaps with mine. And I think that's it for my time. If we have a moment, I don't think we have any more time. So I'll end there. Thank you so much. Did you want to read one more? I can read one more. That'd be wonderful. I'll read another positive poem. Um, this is called You Follow a Gift Guide According to Prince. And I'm a big fan of Prince. I try to sneak his music or lyrics um, whenever I can. So this blends Prince and motherhood. I'm also a mom and I do a lot of work on maternal studies. So it's the blending of all these lovely worlds. Again, you follow a gift guide according to Prince. The gifted pink cashmere coat huddles with the purple denim jackets in the hallway closet. But I detest pink ever since Lynn did, dared me to chain stuff pink crayons up my nose. 
My mother dislodged them with tweezers and chuckled like a song at the watering hole. At least you did not ruin the good crayons. Of course not. The Melissa and Doug packs were saved for fast driving fun at the doctor's office and giving the bathtub a full facelift. On cool rainy days in the mountains of Adjuntas, cashmere is too pretty, pretty and gentle to wear. Without a front door moment, the fibers bad mouth clouds and recede like kneeling light. If you ask me that I want the feel good raspberry beret, I promise to wear it on occasions that are more than just moments to bad hair days. When the stars are low, I will fling it at the moon and watch it heartbeat back in colors that we have known all of our lives. Thank you again so much. Thanks so much. I put a note, if you want to post a link for your book, please do. Um, Lori posted links for her books. Uh, you'll find them in the chat. And please uh, think about um, purchasing a book if you can. All right. We're going to start with the open mic. And for those of you who haven't read here before, the rule is, as in much uh, other open mic uh, rules, uh, it's two poems or five minutes, whichever comes first. And the first person, it's a very small open mic, so it's full for today, unfortunately. Um, our first person on the open is James Keene. You're, you're, yeah, there you go. Am I okay? Thank you very much. And uh, Lori and Dorcia, Dorcia, is that how you say it? Excellent, bravo. I'm, I'm, I'm not good at putting down, I'm afraid to get off the screen to, to do all that stuff, but both of you very, very, very well. Bravo, bravo. Just so I did, I did listen. Anyway, um, we just celebrated, my wife and I, our 40th wedding anniversary. And, uh, <laughs> Well, at least you're clapping. You should see it. I don't know if my wife is clapping. That she actually is. Um, so I thought I'd write this. I, I wrote this poem of thank you actually years ago, but it still holds true. And I'd like to read it now. It's called Thank You for Being My Wife. And by just a preface, I met my wife more than 40 years ago at the Pilgrim Diner in Cedar Grove, New Jersey. Uh, she was behind the counter and I was one of her customers. And I think I still am. She's not behind the counter. Anyway, uh, she's a psychotherapist now. So anyway, thank you for being my wife. Do you remember me? I asked when I accidentally ran into you at the gym. I should, you retorted. I only serve you three times a week. Thank you for being my wife. I'm 29, I said, when you asked. You're mature for your age, you said. You just turned 23. Thank you for being my wife. Awful was your reply instead of the usual fine when I asked you, how are you doing? Sitting at your counter at the Pilgrim Diner. I never asked you again. You told me anyway. Thank you for being my wife. When I bugged you for the umpteenth time with, did I leave the car lights on? You snapped, yeah. And the doors are wide open and the engine's running. <laughs> Thank you for being my wife. All kidding aside, when my father did what he did and died, you pulled and pulled and pulled me back from the darkness that made my life seem pointless. Thank you for being my wife. Days became nights, became decades of your unwavering love. Even in the face of anger and unkindness, the burden you with strife you don't deserve and never will. But please know this. I've loved you half my life. The better half. And better still, thank you for being my wife. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, James. Doesn't make uh, up for anything. <laughs> 
And now um, somebody new to our community coming to us from all the way from England, uh, Rip Oakley. And he has an announcement as well as a poem. Rip, are you there? Uh oh. He has he's to there, unmute. But he's, it's there, but muted. Oh, you have to unmute. So unmute. find them. Okay, am I there? Yes, but your picture's gone again. <laughs> Sorry, a bit too, a bit too, a bit too strong. Your picture is gone. We can't see oh, you. That's very we weird. Yes, it is. Okay, okay, I'll press. <laughs> there on. you go. Oh. Sorry about this. I'm not That's very okay. technical. That's okay. Anyway, look, thank you, Robbie, for inviting me. And the reason you, you we met first online only a few days ago when Robbie sent me a poem for an anthology, which I'm editing with my, my friend and neighbor, Mary Williams, um, on Trump and Trumpism. And the title of the anthology is What Rough Beast? taken from William Butler Yeats's very fine poem, The Second Coming, which I'm sure you all know. And uh, I'm going to read just the one poem, which I hope Merrin will pass. Merrin sees everything unsigned, so it's up to her. The orator. He teases with smug questions, like someone stroking a dog. So you like that, do you? What about this word then, or this one? The belly, the ears, the scruff. Everything receives an avid cheer, but his gauge for difference is acute. With perfect scale, he distinguishes the minutest scintilla of decibel from its logarithmic neighbor. But one election he can never win. The one for a place beside Allende, Kennedy, King, Devi, Lumumba, Palmer, Cox, Dando, Kennedy, Hammarskjöld, Sadat, Hara, all the disappeared, dispatched, stadium butchered souls of the past two generations. No, for that one, he would not have been eligible. Thank you, everybody. Rip, would you please give some uh, a link, information where people can send their poems? Yeah, what, what, I'll, what, I, what I'll do, Rob, is I'll post it on your Facebook timeline tomorrow. But well, not work? everybody, not everybody here is on my Facebook. Okay, well, well, well the, the, the website to go to is culturematters.org dot uk click on the poetry section and you'll find their announcement there culturematters.org.uk great that's it okay so anybody um you're also taking artwork and am i correct yeah we're looking for artwork and we're looking for material from the everybody anywhere in the world any language so you know people in wherever it is, Canada or Gabon or or, or, or Panama, you tell them about it. And we will publish in the language they write it. Excellent. Well, we have some people coming to us from other countries here. So um, they can perhaps send you some things. And when's your deadline again? It's a deadline. There's a long deadline, so work on it. Don't leave us to tell you this stuff. Um, it, no, it's the end of November. Okay. So there's plenty of time. All right. Thank you so much. Our next reader is David. Oh, I didn't write your last name down. You know who you are. I think you're the only right. David here today. Yeah. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, Oliveira is how I say it. Uh, and uh, thank you, Laurie and Dorcia. I really enjoyed re your, your reading. 
I have uh, one poem <laughs> to read today. Uh, it's called uh, Artificial Intelligence, a Meditation. <laughs> the world, when not breaking your heart, has you in a chokehold. Earth seems intent that the human race won't survive. Go ahead, be an optimist anyway. It's just not a winning bet. Humans are the product of the first AI. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, making DNA, then randomly combining it into neurons and synapses that conspired to create reason, then reasons for reason. Despite significant production flaws in the original model, humans are trying their own hand at AI, this time using copper, iron, selenium, silica, magnesium, manganese, cadmium, and more to emulate reason and art. Perhaps even soon, love of art. Then where will humankind be? What has humanity done with its mind-blowing proprietary talents? There's no place humans can go that doesn't hurt from their hands. No place that can be cleansed of their touch over the grace of time. A lot of traumas come from natural causes, making these hardships no less painful nor more acceptable in the course of being alive. But most people's hurt is inflicted by other people against their kind. Human-induced trauma is the species' principal product to the world. No one escapes. No one skates by unscarred and unscathed. Empathy is born not out of imagination, but out of experience. Look at the world across the endless, endless variances in humanity. Someone coined the word inhuman. What could they possibly mean? Leibniz of best of all possible worlds fame also offers his theodicy, an apologia for why the omnipotent and omnibenevolent one permits evil. He might be right. His arguments are hard to follow, so who can say? The great thinker, though, didn't put this thought in his writings. It is possible humans may not be the best of all possible creatures. After all, they're just now getting to the unfinished work of creation, their systematic upgrade to the incoming artificial perfection. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh Gary Rosen. Okay, here I am. You must be muted. I thought I'd unmute it, but I was just telling David that I was just reading this morning an article about Kurzweil's new book on the singularity. Okay, this poem is one that I wrote that is part of, or by way of explanation, I spent sixth, seventh, and eighth grades living in Ecuador, where my father was assigned. I'm an army brat. And so this is called The Line of the Equator. Picture then the boy standing where he's always stood, will always stand in memory still, a skinny 12-year-old squinting in the sun, there at the equator in the middle of the Andes, an unexpected place for North and South to meet. The equator, its name evokes images of Africa, voyages on sailing ships, and ancient rites of passage. Instead, an alpine plaza a monument of stone. Mark the zero latitude as if upon a map, the equator fixed upon the ground and the boy astride poised between the hemispheres caught in black and white. 
in the photo, if you had the photo, you would see it. The line of the equator cutting through the plaza and stopping at the monument. But in the inner eye, that line is not restrained by the narrow frame of thought, but crosses the horizon and continues out of sight, bending back upon itself to meet you from behind. And the second poem I ended up writing because we were flying somewhere and I picked up Discover Magazine and about the only time I ever buy magazines is if we're, is if we're flying. This in the days before Kindle. And there was this great photograph by, by, by Stefan Vermar of a living sculpture. And it was in the February 2008 issue of Discover. All these naked backsides melt up along the slopes of this, of this glacier, puddle near the bottom, trickle out of sight. Ragged rock ridges rise up to the left and right, channel the flow, rumps and ice inch along, almost beyond notice. By now, the melt line moves up so fast the down cannot keep up. Now the slow advance gives ground year after year. Too many people. It's not the heat of the feet, but all those sighs, the ins and outs of breaths, the buses that take them home. These bare bodies speak as only flesh can speak. As we are now, Soon you in this valley also will be naked, exposed to eye and sky. Thank you, Gary. Very nice. Rose, it's your turn. Okay. I can have even learned how to unmute myself. Uh, I'm coming to you from Lima, Peru. And my poems need no explanation. I don't even remember from which book they are. Uh, and Jim, don't worry, I don't have a long one this time. Jazz breaks my heart. Swinging on the blue notes, getting stung by altera uh, alterations, drowning gladly in the chase, leaning back into the groove. I hear the inner voice fragmented between the bass and the break, lost in fusion. Melodic minor harmonies render me helpless. And the other one is a memory from long years of England. English Spring Sunday. We met at the station and drove into the Shire. I'd forgotten how green, wet green is. Talking, catching up. It's been a year. Wasn't really worth opening the brolly. The rain came softly from all sides. The pub, dark and low ceilinged, right by the canal, a fire lit. Steak and kidney pie and a pint, please. We had planned to sit in the garden, watching the boats idling by. Still, it was good. At the next table sat foreigners with loads of kids, all in brightly colored stick slickers. They said they were finished, had hired a longboat for the weekend. The tallest and blondest said, smiling, we have a heat wave in Finland right now. Thank you. Wow. Hard <laughs> to imagine. Uh, Mark? <clears throat> she wore a raspberry beret, the kind you buy in a secondhand store. Love that song, Doria. You got me thinking about it. 
Um, I'm reading a poem. I got a book for my birthday. My, my wife gives me birthday books of poems and it was written by uh, Pulitzer Prize winners or poet laureates and they were all nature poems. And two of the people that we've had in our group, Diane Zeus and uh, Ellen Bass were included in that in an anthology. And there was one that Ellen Bass wrote at Lighthouse Point in Santa Cruz, which really hit me because I wrote a poem many, many years ago at Lighthouse uh, Point in Santa Cruz. And I'd like to share that one with you. Uh, it's called Lighthouse Point. Uh, and it's dated November 24, 2000. And at the time, my son was nearing his third birthday. A child notices his shadow stretching long across the lawn to where the cliff surrenders to the sea. His father stands next to him. Their shadows linked, bleed together in the late afternoon autumn sun. An old surfer who rode long balsa boards in the frigid surf stops to tell the two of a sandbank where children learn to surf. That's where we all begin, he says. It's where we all return. The waves at this point rise three head high. Young men in black wetsuits, sleek as sea lions, take off on fiberglass boards, cutting immense liquid curls. The child sticks his head through the fence to throw a rock into the sea. His father holds him back for the moment. Thank you. Unfortunately, I couldn't read the um, Bass poem on Facebook. It was too pale. I'll get you a copy, Robbie. It's, I know I was trying to re recover and I couldn't find it elsewhere, but it's a beautiful poem and it's also about children. It's Maybe a better poem than mine, but you know, Ellen's a great poet. Well, Ellen Bass. <laughs> you can scan, you can scan it. In the I book. tried that. <laughs> okay. I'll talk to you more. Uh, all right. Um, Mary? Okay. I'm really enjoying everybody's poems. Lovely reading. Uh, I'm going to read one from my uh, book that came out last November. The uh, book is How to Become Invisible, and it's about my experience with bipolar disorder. This poem is called Saving Face. After it's over, I'll count my spoons and line the plates up and swear no one ever took anything from me I wasn't ready to give. If I do this well enough, I might even convince myself, but I feel the cracks spreading underneath my fresh plaster and the pipes are leaking somewhere in the cellar. My thoughts needle me with all odds, odd suspicions, and I can't dial down my rampant swings from grief to jubilation. I don't think I'll get away with my pretense of order smooth as an egg without a cloud or question to mark its perfect surface. I think I must go down with all the other tatterdemalions too rough and raggedy to let in the house too mad to expect anything less. And this other one is a newer one. It's called, There Is No Empty Space. Clearing your thoughts is like digging in sand. So fast as you scoop it out, the fine grains slide back down the slope you've opened, filling it up again. Inevitable as your next breath, which always comes and comes, smooth or ragged, easy or forced, until the last one, when the great bellows of the lungs close on their own folds like an accordion, pressed down and locked when the music stops. 
even those great spaces between the stars are filled with stuff we cannot see or imagine, but trace from its pool on everything we've already measured, real as our own bodies that take air in and return it, reshaped as music we can only approximate in numbers, the shadow, the bare skeleton that only hints at the glory of the song. Thank, Thank you. you, Mary. It's good to see you. Good to see uh, you too. John, um, I can put you in now. John, That'd be great if you, if you have time. Yes, uh, one poem, please. Okay. It's called The Banks of, the, of Chautauqua Lake. The ice age that ground its way through this land left its memory here all around us. You can still visualize glaciers moving like giant white slugs across the land, eating the earth until these sharp hills formed, until these deep valleys were created, until the ice melted and formed these narrow dark lakes. You stand today on the steep bank of the lake and think about how this slope must keep going down into the Earth's subconscious, where a memory of snow lives. Once it was covered by ice, now by water, but down there has always been dark. Okay. Our next reader is Jim. Thank you. And just let me quickly say, I still have room for four or five more poets in for the September issue of Verse Virtual. Um, if you're interested in submitting, it needs to be by tonight at 11.59 p.m. And I'm going to read a single poem that was prompted by the unexpected resignation of a co-worker a number of years ago. And the rest of you have probably experienced this as well when someone suddenly is no longer with the company. So this is called Rumors of Rumors with a, a significant nod to the original bard. Another oozy dismissal, here so long, so quickly gone. No explanation, no public announcement, just the corporate line, he has resigned. Well, should we light a scandal for him? Burn him at both ends without knowing what wicked, wicked things he might have done? Watch his reputation dance in the rumor's flame and melt away, down, down, unevenly down and away in the flickering scandal light? Rather, out, out and out, brief scandal. Let this spreading shadow cut his hour short and then be heard of here no more. Snuff, 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 a wisp of smoke, then silence. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I haven't uh, had much published recently except all at once, you know, just when you think that's it. A uh, whole bunch pours out at once. So I've had some things accepted and some things published in the past few days. And, but I'm not going to read any of them. I'm going to read a watermelon poem because inspired by Laurie's watermelon poem. Summer on a Plate. I don't know how old I was when I first noticed that watermelons smell like new mown grass, the smell of summer evenings after dinner, when there's still plenty of light to play by and you can't wait to run outside before the lightning bugs arrive. The fleet of ice cream trucks begin to drive slow circles round the block. There's still a wedge of melon smiling at you on the Pyrex platter. Black shiny seeds and ghostly white ones form a face you want to bite. 
feel the sticky juice run down your chin. Maybe it's the rind that has that faintly sour tang of grass, the flesh heavy with liquid, red and sweet, has another sort of scent, like cold water when you've been running and all you want to do is put your head under the flowing hose and drink until the water pours down your neck and shirt and you finally feel cool. Thank you so much uh, for being here and for reading and thanks to our features uh, for contributing uh, their wonderful work. Uh, and I hope that you'll come back again, uh, even when you're not featuring, even just to listen. Thank you so much. And I am going to also be hosting a reading on Wednesday. Uh, the feature is uh, Susan Cohen. I think this is it, uh, the link to it. Um, you need to register. Well, thank you, Kathleen, and thank you other first time um, folks. It's good to have you, and I hope you'll come back again. All right, take care. If you want to just hang out and talk, I'll stop the recording. If I can find it, there we go.